unfortunately, we are living through a time where so many people are focused on their individual concerns and their individual perspective, and there's no dialogue happening. And I think this is particularly pronounced in social media because you can really just follow people that agree with you and unfollow people who disagree with you. And I think we lose so much when we do that. And we are rapidly becoming a society that does not know how to speak to one another. Welcome to the Kindness Is podcast, where we take a deep dive into the true meaning of kindness. I'm your host, Caitlin Johnstone, the co-founder of Kind Cotton. Let's dive in. Wake up. You know, it's not so often that you get to hear about the work of progressive Christians, particularly over the past couple of years. And I thought it was very important to highlight the voices of progressive Christians, to hear what they believe Christianity is, how it has been weaponized, how Christian nationalism is probably one of the most dangerous things to our democracy, to our country, and to our lives, and what we can do to combat that. So I hope you enjoy our guest this week. This is going to be a two-part episode because we just had so many incredible things to talk about that I couldn't condense it into 20 to 30 minutes. So enjoy part one today of the Kindness Is Pod. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Kindness Is Podcast. Today I have Imelda, who goes by E, and Trudy on here, who are the co-hosts of Pray With Our Feet, an intergenerational community and podcast uplifting the intersection of progressive Christian faith and social justice. I also have to start out by saying I'm very excited to have a mother-daughter duo here because being someone who is incredibly close with my own mom, it feels very special to have you both here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I noticed that too from your Instagram. I'm like, oh, yay, another fellow, fellow woman who's deeply close with her mom. It's beautiful. Yeah, for sure. So I'm very excited because I have been connected with E for, I guess, a few months now on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the beauty that you were putting out into this world and also knowing how very deeply you were both connected to your faith but also knowing in that same regard that being connected to your faith means doing what is best for humanity has been very refreshing. So I'd love to start there if that's okay with you all. Yes, thank you. You know, before you hit, hit record, we were talking about, you know, the ways that Christianity has been misused. And in founding Pray With Our Feet and mom working alongside me, we really wanted to create a community, a space that uplifts what Christ is all about and what Christ's consciousness is about. And the roots of that are love, peace, kindness, understanding, really being in beloved community. I feel like, unfortunately, We are living through a time where so many people are focused on their individual concerns and their individual perspective, and there's no dialogue happening. And I think this is particularly pronounced in social media because you can really just follow people that agree with you and unfollow people who disagree with you. And I think we lose so much when we do that. And we are rapidly becoming a society that does not know how to speak to one another. And that has drastic consequences. And I think we're seeing that play out not only in politics, but even just in the day-to-day ways that we interact with one another and how we how we show up. And I just think that it's so important for people to understand that Christianity is not about power and control, but it's about a deep relationship and connection with God. And then that should ripple out into the way that you treat other people and other living beings and the environment. And I think too, just to add to that, that that part of our part of our goal has been to focus attention on social justice, but from a biblical perspective. And to encourage people not only to be socially conscious or aware of the injustices, but to take it a step further. Okay, so I know that there's a problem here. What am I going to do about it? 
in the context of what it means to be a Christian. And I think too, one of the things that, that we always take in, into consideration is we want people to take the words of Jesus seriously. We, as, as Christians, we wanna to strive to live out that mandate. What are we called to do? In, in what way do we show kindness? You know, in what way do we exhibit love? You know, uh, when people look at you or me, can they see Jesus in us or do they see something else? And so we've tried to over the over the past few years to kind of tackle issues from that perspective, hoping that we will encourage people, hoping that we will, um, you know, motivate them just to want to see things differently, just to want to do things differently. Um, and, and not to be so much caught up in the cause, but to be caught up in the one who can bring about the change. And so that's, that's, been, our, uh, that's, that's, that's been our focus over the last, what, five years now? Yeah, well, yeah, we're coming up on five years. And mom, yeah. while you were talking, I was just thinking about something that I meant to lift up. We choose a guiding scripture for each of our podcast yeah. episodes. Um, or I'm sorry, seasons or a theme. And lately we've been really leaning into scripture verses like Matthew 25, 40, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done it for me, which is one of our core, you know, guiding um, mantras in terms of the way that we, we really show up and pray with our feet and encourage people to take action. Yeah. And, and when, when we talk about, well, when the scriptures talk about the least of these, of course, you know, in, in our world today, that also directs us to think about, well, who are the least of these? Who are the people that we see day to day? And, and again, let me rephrase that, that we don't see, but now we do need to see on a day to day basis. People that we have passed by and have thought nothing about. That guy on the corner who is looking for a handout. What's his story? Why is he there? Uh, are we called just to be dismissive and, and judgmental and say, oh, well, you know, he could work, but he won't. He's a bum, da, 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 da. But no, begin to see the person. I love in the scriptures where, G, where, where the scriptures often say Jesus looked at the woman or Jesus looked at the man. Because I believe that when Jesus did that, he saw the whole person. He saw their whole story. He was empathetic to what they were going through. And he did something about it. He just didn't look at them and say, oh, 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 you poor, poor thing. Be blessed in the Lord, check with you later. No, he did something. And that's what we're hoping that we are uh, um, encouraging people to do, to do something. I have so many thoughts right now. The first, because you just mentioned it, Trudy, is seeing someone and then feeling that empathy. I I mentioned this on another podcast recently, but I grew up with a very unconventional dance teacher and she mm -hmm. used to have us do an exercise in which we just stood in front of one another. We were not allowed to speak. We just looked at one another for upwards of like a minute or two. And almost every single time it brought us to this intense, feeling of joy and also sorrow at the same time like we would we would typically end up in tears and it was because we could see that person in their deepest humanity yeah oftentimes we do see in the christian community people weaponizing christianity and e you mentioned how important it is to hear one another and to talk to one another one another so my question to you all is how do you have those conversations with people who may be using Christianity in a light that you don't see is in the name of Jesus? I, 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 think, I think that kind of conversation has to be approached if, if the person is open mm -hmm. to coming to an understanding that 
Jesus calls us to a relationship, not to religion. There's a, there's a, there's a big difference there. Relationship speaks to being intimate with him, knowing him, abiding in him, and, 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 and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to live out life within you. Religion is rules and regulations and methods and, 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 and when you go down that trail, you can easily politicize and weaponize uh, religion. Uh, and, then, and then you can, you can kind of cover it over with, with what you think is Jesus, but it, but it really isn't. So how do you approach that with, with others who've gone down that trail? Uh, another aspect of that is, is to demonstrate to them that Jesus is all about love and that I'm going to love you even though I may not agree with you, but I'm going to love you, love you enough so that you can begin hopefully, hopefully to see Jesus in, in my life. Um, I think one of the things that has occurred to me in recent months, when you look at the, um, the weaponization of Christianity, is the realization from my vantage point that that segment of the church has slipped into idolatry and they really don't even know it. They're not worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping politics. Mm -hmm. They're worshiping hatred. They're worshiping racism. They've, re they, they've replaced Jesus as the center and the focal point of their relationship with all of these other things and duped themselves into believing that they are being Christian. Yeah. Yeah. They really have. And, you know, I think the other thing that's so important and can sometimes be an entryway into helping people like that broaden their understanding is the power of storytelling and the power of listening to other people's lived experiences. And that's yes. one of the reasons why we wanted to start a podcast, because it's very easy for people to write off the immigrant, to write off the LGBTQ plus community, to write off individuals of color without you knowing their story. Unfortunately, what they have bought into is these sort of stereotypes about groups, whole groups of people, and they're not looking at the individual. And I think that's something that really needs to be, you know, broken open. And that's how you get to empathy and understanding and love and kindness is seeing the person, you know, just like my mom was speaking to earlier about Jesus seeing. I wrote a devotional several months ago now, I think it was last year, about the urgency of seeing with the heart. That's how God sees. God looks within the heart and sees from the heart. And I think that that sort of making space for those conversations, and even if, even if the person just sees a clip of someone talking from our podcast and sharing a little bit of their story, that may be an entryway to get them to begin to think differently and come out of these stereotypes about whole groups of people and see begin to see the individual. Oh, they're just, they're like me in some ways because we all have something that connects us. We all do. And yeah. I think the work is pushing beyond those divisions and seeing where we can connect in terms of commonality. Yeah. And, and I think just to add to that, I think it's also very important if we take this back to a biblical perspective. In the very beginning, uh, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, I, uh, you know, in, in the first chapter where, where God says, let us make man, let us make humanity. And that that humanity is created in the image of God. How revolutionary would it be if we would see each individual created in the image of God. That would wipe away the stereotypes. That would eradicate the racism. 
Because when I see you, I see you in the image of God. I see you as someone valued by God. And I think when I look at um, what is the development of Christian nationalism in this country, uh, uh, the lack of seeing each other as created in the image of God and the prevalence of racism if we don't get a hold of that root, then it will it, it will change the church and not for the better. And so the I'm I'm really concerned about the future of the church in America. And let's be honest about it about this in this conversation. When we talk about Christian nationalism, it also reflects the fact that the history of the church in America has been a segregated history. Okay, so let's 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 be honest. When we talk about Christian nationalism, nine times out of ten, we're talking about the white evangelical. Because if you go into the black church, the black evangelical, you don't find that. No. And I'm really, really happy that you brought that up because we had a discussion about. Christian nationalism a little bit before recording and it's incredibly dangerous because it is very much rooted in white supremacy. Yes. And it, I mean, it's, I feel as though they go hand in hand as someone who was a Christian growing up, like as a child, I can remember going to church and honestly, as a white child, I think it's very important to name that. The only time I felt joy or safety was when I went to my friend's black church. It was a very, yeah. very different experience for me even. Um, and I'm happy that I have the had the privilege in being able to do so. As an adult, I am not practicing of a religion. So when you say in your mind, if everyone could see people in the eyes of God, right? And and how God would see them. To me, I kind of like change that in my mind as if we could all see each other within our deepest humanity. And I wanna say what your message would be to, to other non-Christians particularly who may be listening to this, because I think that may be something that would be important to them to hear. I think, I, I, yeah, I, I I understand what you're saying. See, seeing others in in your own humanity. The only thing that I would I would add to that is bringing in bringing in um, empathy in, in, mm. into that process. Uh, you know, we often talk about walking in someone else's shoes, knowing that person's story, uh, realizing that everybody has a story. Um, and that story involves success, it involves failure, it involves hurts, um, it, it involves shared experiences. Mm -hmm. Certain things that I have done, that you have done, and how do and 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 how do we look at that and what's our connection? So if you're talking about reaching out to the non-Christian and helping them to see that, that you know, that would be one way of of, a, of approaching that. I realize that um, when you're dealing with with someone who is is not a follower of Jesus, that conversation is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I think the I think the same components are there are of are there of love, of empathy, of seeing that person as valued. Mm -hmm. Maybe I wouldn't necessarily uh, right off the bat use the, the terminology created in the image of God, but I would say to them, this person is valued. Mm -hmm. This person is valued because of who they are. Uh, what they've done in their lives, what 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 hopes and dreams do they have that are similar to the hopes and dreams that you had? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where that's where the connection comes in. And when we get back to the Christian nationalist movement, that's what's missing there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just got very excited because there is that lack of of humanity and that lack of like I 
was preaching this so much at the start of the pandemic, for example, because I feel like that was a, a moment in time where we really saw people's individualism come to the forefront of our society on a very global level. Yes. And I used to say over and over, kindness is something that doesn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you. I don't need to have had someone in my family die of COVID for me to wear a mask in a public space. I don't need to have my child be black for me to understand the severity of of needing police reform. I don't need me or or my family members to be a part of the LGBTQ plus community for me to fight for their rights, right? Like it doesn't necessarily even have to be this lived experience for you to see and hear other people's stories and yeah. value. Yeah, that is such an important point because I think I, I like you had high hopes during the pandemic that well, maybe not too high, but that <laughs> some people, you know, really empathize. And what we saw was a doubling down on toxic individualism that mm. unless I'm personally affected by something, I don't care. And even now, because we are still in a pandemic, there are Thank so you. many people who are suffering from long COVID. I have a good friend, Jen, who raises a lot of awareness about this online and through her platform, Chronically Connected Perspective. And she really she really does a lot to lift that up, like wearing a mask, these, these really simple things that you can do to ensure not just for you that you're protected, but that the whole community is protected. And that individualism is running through everything in this country. And it's something that people grow up ingesting. And then, you know, they take that out with them into the world. And when we see awful things like COVID-19 and George Floyd and all these things, they can't get their own experience out of their mind and to, to deepen into that empathy. And I, I really think that it's something that needs to be taught from home. And then also, of course, I know this would be a huge fight, but within school systems, yes. you know, because it really is not just, um, it's a way of being and moving through the world that we need to, to drop into. And unless it becomes a daily practice, it's very difficult for people to do that. Because if you're constantly just thinking of yourself and your community, you know, I, I, I just think that it really is something that needs to be practiced and lived and lived out. Because if not, we replicate this toxic individualism and capitalism that that is just so unconcerned with inequality and all these things. We see the ripple effects of that. Well, I, I just want to add to that, that the... Uh, individualistic response to COVID. You know, I'm going to do my own thing. If I don't want to wear a mask, I don't have to do it. Really, when we look at the history of this country, rugged individualism has always been part of the mindset uh, that has shaped both the past and the present. I can do this my way. Mm -hmm. I will pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Uh, within the with within the historical development of America, only the indigenous communities had a sense of community, had a sense that my identity comes from the community. Those uh, um, uh, communities saw themselves as one acting as one, being a part of uh, a, a, a community that works together, whose identity is tied in with that. So let's fast forward to COVID. We saw that kind of individualism heightened and weaponized and politicized. And I really think more people would ha not have died if we had just realized that we should work together as a community to mm -hmm. attack and defeat COVID. And the irony that so many of these people who scream pro-life all the time don't want you to wear a mask, don't care about what's happening to immigrants, 
don't care about the numerous atrocities all over the world, but they're pro-life, but they're pro-life for people who look like them. Yes. Mm -hmm. who are white who are, um, who practice the kind of Christianity that they practice, who are affluent. Mm -hmm. It's this selective care, as opposed to mom, like what you were referring to with indigenous communities, a communal care and, and a scene of all as connected and not separate. But it's like, you have to be the right kind of person for me to be kind to and for me to care about. And that is extremely dangerous. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. The right kind of person. Uh, be, because even looking at, my mind goes back to the uh, Germany in World War II, you know, and the rise of Hitlerism and, and the Holocaust. And that was, once you devalue people, once you dehumanize them, then you feel justified in doing whatever. So you can, you can annihilate six million Jews you can annihilate six million other people, the handicapped, those who were mentally challenged, those who were in the gay community. You know, you can annihilate them because you've dehumanized them. Mm -hmm. And you can live without any uh, 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 worries or, or, or qualms of conscience because these people aren't real. I don't see them. I can just wipe them out. Yeah. And that's that that that's as a as a as a person who is in the minority in this country, that's one of the things that bothers me now. Really does. I can tell you truthfully, and I hope I'm not being overly uh, overly reacting to this, but mm -hmm. if we don't begin to really take a hard look at where we are, both politically within the church. I'm concerned that we may reach a point where we feel justified in eradicating certain people that we don't deem to be human and we can do it without any conscience whatsoever. Unfortunately, I think we're at that point when you look at what's happening in Gaza, mm -hmm. over 20,000 people mm -hmm. killed, Palestinians, over 10,000 of those children, and one in 10 um, children in Gaza losing a limb a day without amputation. And there are people just going on about their lives as if nothing is happening and saying, you know, calling for a ceasefire is seen as something that is so radical and so destructive, you know, instead of wanting the suffering to end and knowing that there is no, there's no resolution in continuing to fight and fight and fight. It only begets more. What did Gandhi say? An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. I, I sadly think that we are at that point now. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, so something I say often is I can, some, someone asked me recently, like, well, were you for the Iraq war? And I was 16 at the time, right? When 9-11 happened and I can remember being scared and I lived in New York and it was a really, it was a really scary time. But I also know from the beginning, I was adamantly against it because regardless of the atrocities that happened, right? I, I could hold, I could hold multiple truths. I could say that was horrible what mm -hmm. happened, just as I can say what happened on October 7th was horrible what happened. But in the same regard, okay. I can see humanity and say that the retaliation is not acceptable, that that children and and all humans, I, I I know we we focus on the children because it is so important, and I think we do that a lot of times because maybe that will allow people to to empathize a little bit more. But all innocent civilians are not collateral damage, right? Like we are talking about lives here, and I think that's something that we need to continue talking about because unfortunately. Something I something I often say too, and and I am a I'm a part of this, is that I don't think any of us are safe from these white supremacist systems. 
right? Myself included. Like, like climate change isn't saving me. And that's very much a product of, of individualism, of capitalism, of white supremacy systems. And if we're not actively doing something about this, then we are not actively caring for other humans. Yes, because kindness is action. And it's, it's, it's having the courage to, you know, as we've been lifting up so much in this conversation to see, to see one. And if you see that someone is hurting, then your response shouldn't be to ignore that. It should be to ask, what can I do? Whether that's signing a petition, sharing a social media mm -hmm. post, listening to their story, because so often people think they know and they come with all of these assumptions and they make up their own perspectives based on these assumptions instead of really taking the time to care. I think so often in our culture, we throw out words like kindness and inclusion and empathy because they sound good, but we don't actually take the time to ask, what does this look like when it's lived out? And it's the simplest, sometimes it's the simplest of things. Do you have a neighbor next door that's older that has a hard time getting out? Can you offer to go to the store for them? It doesn't always have to be, you know, organizing a grand march. It's so often those small, acts of community care that are almost like a ripple. And if we're all doing these small acts, it ripples out and ripples out and ripples out. And before we know it, we have a different community. We have we have a different culture. Yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, again, kindness has to spring from love. Uh, if that love isn't there, then I'm not going to be kind. If love isn't there, I'm going to be cruel. I'm going to be judgmental. I'm going to be dismissive of you. I won't see you because there is no real genuine love for who you are as a person. There's no real genuine love for, for your humanity. Um, if love had been there, the situation in the Middle East with uh, Hamas attacking on October the 7th and carrying a kidnapping and killing and doing other atrocities, that would not have happened. If love had been there, the over 20,000 Palestinians would be alive now. But because that love was not manifested, there was no kindness, there was no mercy, there was no grace. And we're called, and, and, and I like what, what my daughter just said, to demonstrate that kindness on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe nobody knows that you went next door and you knocked on the neighbor's door. You, you don't do it for, for recognition. You do it because you're motivated by love and that, and, that, and that causes you to be kind to that person, regardless to whether they return that kindness to you. See, a lot of times I think we're looking for people to pat us on the back and to and to and and to uplift us. Well, when if that's what you're looking for, then you weren't being kind. Kindness should not be transactional. Yes. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Kindness Is podcast. If you love it and it's adding even a little bit of value to your life, we would love, love, love if you could subscribe, rate, and review so we can reach even more people and make this world a little bit more kind.